Hi, I'm Karen and I'm working as a postdoctoral researcher in the group of Professor Bloch at the LMU in Munich. I'm sitting here in one of our labs where we are building so-called quantum simulators. The experiment is currently running and this is what produces this noise that you can hear in the background. But nevertheless, in the next few quantum minutes, I will explain what quantum simulation is and how it could help us to develop new useful materials. The world's energy demand is continuously growing and in addition we need to advance the use of renewable energy sources. So imagine we can put a lot of solar cells in the desert or a lot of wind power plants in the ocean to generate a nice huge amount of renewable energy. But using the power lines we currently have, a lot of energy gets lost on the way. So it would be great if we could reduce these losses or even get rid of them completely. This could be possible using superconducting cables. A superconductor is a material that loses its electrical resistance when it is cooled below a certain so-called critical temperature. So below that temperature, it can conduct electricity without any loss. So basically, it would be the perfect cable. However, the critical temperatures of superconductors are usually very, very low. So something around minus 260 degrees Celsius or you would need to apply very high pressure to make a material superconducting, which is of course not very useful for applications. But already some decades ago, some new materials have been found in which these critical temperatures are particularly high. And by high, I mean now they lie above minus 196 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of nitrogen. So of course, this is still far below room temperature, but it means that we can cool these materials using liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium, which makes their use already much easier and cheaper. So these so-called high TC superconductors are already used in applications, but up to now we don't know why the critical temperatures are so high. So we don't know what is going on on a microscopic scale in these materials, but if we understood the physical mechanisms behind high TC superconductivity, on the one hand, we would be able to improve the materials we already have, but on the other hand, we could even go further and develop new materials, which could be superconducting at normal pressure and room temperature. So of course, this would be very great for many applications, having lossless power transmission at normal temperature. So what do we know about high TC superconductors? Most of these materials consist of copper oxide planes combined with other kinds of atoms like yttrium or barium, for example. And these atoms are arranged in a so-called crystal. So a structure similar to salt or ice. So we can imagine that our IC superconductors look similar to this model on an atomic scale. So we have the atoms being arranged in this cubic lattice, in this case here, and now some of the electrons, which originally belong to each atom, can move freely around in this crystal. So that means we have a lattice made of ions and the freely moving electrons. And it's exactly this interplay between the electrons and the lattice, which determines the special properties of these materials. So now we can even write down simplified equations that describe these kinds of systems but using the current supercomputers, we are not able to solve these equations. And here, quantum simulation comes into play. Instead of solving the equations, what we do is we build a model system in our lab that mimics these crystals. And if we do it right, our model system is described by the same equations as the real ITC superconductor, for example. So this means by observing our model system, which is called the quantum simulator, we can learn about what is going on inside these special materials to understand them better. To simulate such a high DC superconductor, for example, we need now two ingredients. First, we need something that represents this ionic lattice. And second, we need some particles that can move around in the lattice to play the role of the electrons. 
So the cool thing is now that we can build something similar to these lattices just using laser light. I've prepared a little experiment to show you how this works. Our light crystal is formed by the interference of laser beams. In this simplified setup here, I'm interfering two laser beams. So we have the first beam, which travels along this direction here. So now if we turn down the light, we can see the beam as a big spot here on the screen. And then we have a second beam traveling along here. And now if I put both of them together, we can see that we now get this stripe pattern. So at some points, the two light waves amplify and at some other points, they cancel each other out. So we get this regular arrangement of minima and maxima, which we call a one-dimensional optical lattice. So this would effectively mimic a one-dimensional crystal. We can go further and, for example, interfere four laser beams instead of two to create a two-dimensional optical lattice. So that would look like this. We have again minima and maxima now being arranged in a square lattice pattern. So now we need the second ingredient, namely some particles that play the role of the electrons moving in the crystal. Using our light crystals, what we do in our labs is we trap atoms in these optical lattices to play the role of the electrons. So now we have here the atoms sitting in the minima of the lattice. But due to quantum mechanics, they can tunnel through the light barriers of the optical lattice and move around in the lattice, pretty much like the electrons moving in the crystal. So this means what we have done here is we have built a model of our real crystal. In particular, what you can see is we have modeled a two-dimensional copper oxide plane, for example, of a high to C superconductor looking like this. To observe the atoms in the lattice, we take another laser with a different color and a very big microscope objective and take snapshots of the atoms. This is a real snapshot taken from one of our labs where we can see atoms being on single lattice sites in a very big square lattice. And you could not take these kind of pictures from a real crystal, but using our model system in the lab. Here we see a picture of a vacuum cell taken from one of our setups. This is where the ultra cold atoms and the optical lattices are located. So that's where all the physics is happening. To achieve the ultra low temperatures in the vacuum cell, we also use lasers. So we have lasers to cool the atoms, to make the optical lattice and to image the atoms. That means all in all, we have a lot of lasers and optics. So a typical experimental table, as you can see it here, uh, is full of mirrors and lenses and other optical components. So by observing our model systems, we can learn about the physical mechanisms behind high to C superconductivity and hopefully get a step closer towards the development of new materials which become superconducting at normal pressure and room temperature. Superconductors are also used, for example, in medical applications to build powerful magnets for MRI devices. And in addition, if we would have one day this future room temperature superconductors, it could help us to use nuclear fusion as an efficient energy source. But in addition, there are many more possibilities what we can do in our labs using ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. For example, we can go away from the square lattice pattern that we have seen before and change the geometric arrangement of the laser beams to create, for example, a hexagonal lattice structure that simulates graphene. Another possibility is to advance our toolbox of the quantum simulation and to create, for example, effective magnetic fields for our neutral atoms. This could be done by moving our lattice potential periodically in time. I hope you enjoyed this episode about quantum simulation and stay tuned for more quantum science.